if you don't follow me on Instagram, shameless, shameless self promo, shameless self promo, hit me up over there. We have a lot of fun. You, if you, especially if you hang out with me on my Instagram live streams, you find out the hot gossip that I don't share anywhere else. So hit it up. Hey guys, it is Molly here again, and don't let this sweater fool you. It is uh, 26 degrees or 78 degrees here for my American friends. All right, this is gonna be a long video. Get you a cup of tea, not for spilling, but for sipping, because I've got a lot to say. This is a story that I thought I was gonna share more of in my audiobook. It's not what it looks like, but I didn't. Link to download that is below as well. And I've wanted to share it for a long time, but there's reasons I haven't. And I'm still like, you know, like, oh my God, am I really sharing this? This was like a really big deal in my life. So let's just jump into it. India is somewhere I had always wanted to go. I always had a fascination with India. It was like number one on my list of places I wanted to travel. Indian food has always been my favorite, except I can't find like any good American Indian food, like Indian food in America, Toronto, and London, England have bomb Indian food. India has bomb Indian food, obviously, but I can't find any here, which is very sad. So when I go back to Toronto to visit, you best believe I eat a lot of Indian food. Growing up, like one of my role models, mentors, I called her my big sister, was named Reena. She was from India. I was always fascinated by Hinduism, Buddhism, kind of a lot of like uh, Indian rooted gods, and uh, especially like Ganesh. Ganesh was like a really big part of my um, journey with religion and spirituality. There's just a lot about in like, uh, I love yoga. I don't know, there's just a lot that fascinated me about Indian culture. I found the fashion and the colors to be very beautiful, the tra traditional saris and that kind of thing. The bells on the ankles, like I just, I loved it. I loved henna and the, the artistry behind like traditional henna, you know, that they do at Indian weddings. I went to Rena's Indian wedding. Um, I don't know. I've just always loved India to the point where I would wear like mala beads and Ganesh t-shirts and flowy like Indian style pants. And like people would nickname me India, like in my first job that took me to India. Um, like there was people who only ever referred to me as India. Like they'd see me on the street and be like, Hey India. Um, when I was younger, like I wanted to change my name to India. Like I, I know it's weird. I just loved India. So shout out to all my Indian fans. You guys live in a beautiful country. Um, I love your culture. It's amazing. So when this opportunity with my work came up, I wasn't an entrepreneur yet. Um, it was about a year before I started my own business. Um, so I was working for a company and an opportunity came up to run a service trip. They at the time went to five different countries and I had already been to Kenya with them the previous year when I was 18 um, as just like a, a guest, like I paid to go. Whereas this trip, I was now working for the company, so I was going to be one of the leaders. And the trip was actually being sold as like, go to India with Molly. They let me pick what country and of course, immediately I picked India. So they sold the trip as like, go to India with motivational speaker Molly Burke and it was like this big thing so these kids like a lot of like followers of mine at the time signed on I didn't have a social media following but like followers of me as a speaker um who were like fans of me through that came um and like signed up to go on this trip I believe we had like 25 to 30 kids from ages like 13 to 19 um from both Canada and America one of the boys, Justin, was actually from LA, but most of them were from Canada. And there was three of us that were gonna be leading the trip. Two sighted girls who were just a little bit older than me and me who was blind and 19. And so the way this worked was myself and one of the other leaders would fly to India, I believe four days, yes, four days ahead of the youth arriving and the youth would arrive with our third staff member. So we're gonna call the staff, oh God, let's think of names. I'm not good at this. Emily, I flew ahead with and Vanessa flew with the staff, with the kids. So Emily and I went four days ahead and for me and Emily, we were gonna be in India for a month, four weeks. The youth 
with Vanessa, we're gonna be there for three weeks. So we went four days ahead and stayed three days after, making it an extra week, obviously. Math. And so I was, oh my God, I was so excited at first, but then leading up to the trip, I just had this freaking gut feeling, you guys. Like I just, in my gut, I was like, something's going to go wrong. I got all my shots. I took all my medications. Like we had a whole rule book at the workplace that we and the youth all had to follow before we'd be approved to go on the trip. And um, I went through all of that. So I was like, sure, I was going to be you know, okay health wise, but I was just like, I just had this gut instinct that something wasn't going to go right on this trip. And I was starting to get really anxious and stressed about it. And this is before my anxiety. Like at this time I didn't have PTSD. My PTSD would happen months later. This was, we were going on the trip in August and I developed PTSD from a workplace accident in February, same workplace. You could see why I eventually left. Um, so I didn't have like anxiety or PTSD yet. Like, so it wasn't normal for me to be feeling this like gut anxiety feeling like I couldn't eat the day I was leaving on the trip. My flight was in the afternoon with Emily and I couldn't bring Gypsy, my guide dog at the time with me. And um, so my boyfriend and I, I lived alone in Toronto, but my boyfriend was staying with me for the few days leading up to the trip to help me get ready. And, you know, cause we weren't gonna be seeing each other for a month and we were new in our relationship. We started dating June 3rd and I was leaving at the beginning of August, uh, at the beginning of August, yeah. So we were only like less than two months into our relationship. So of course I was sad to be leaving him. So we were spending as much time together as we could because by the time I got back at late August, early September, he'd be going back to university. So it kind of sucked, but that wasn't the reason I didn't want to go anymore. Like I just had this bad feeling. And so that morning he like bought all my favorite foods and took me to the beaches in Toronto for a picnic. And I like literally couldn't eat. Like I was so anxious and stressed out. And he was like, you're just like upset to be leaving Gallup and, or not Gallup, Gypsy and me. But I was like, no, that's not it. I just feel like something bad is gonna happen. And girl, I've since learned to always listen to my gut feeling, always, because your gut is always right, okay? Um, so, I ended up, he took me to the airport in his car. We parked and I met with my parents at the airport and Emily and her parents. So my parents, I dropped Gypsy off with them. I said goodbye to my parents. I said goodbye to my boyfriend, um, met Emily's parents, said bye to them. And Emily and I went off with my cane. Now, I don't wanna get into too much detail because it is a whole separate saga in my life. Emily and I were not a good match. I, we didn't get along, we'll say it like that it was not we weren't vibey we didn't get on it wasn't a good connection that is definitely something i will share in a future book though because that was a, a whole hot mess in my life my relationship with emily but my workplace paired the two of us up for this trip so i was like all right you know i want to go to india this is my trip emily and i this was like the first time we were going to be spending like a lot of time together you know i'm 19 i'm blind i was not as independent then as i am now i was still like very independent but not to the level I am now and I had my cane which taking away my guide dog takes away a lot of my independence you know the flight I think our travel itinerary ended up taking us almost 48 hours to get from Toronto airport to Udaipur in Rajasthan all my Indian followers are probably thinking I'm butchering that pronunciation so I'm very sorry I know when we were traveling through to get to Udaipur like whatever we would tell anybody because we flew from Toronto to Germany, had a layover there. Germany to Delhi had a like 10 hour layover throughout the middle of the night there. So everything was closed, it sucked. And then in the morning had a short like hour long flight from Delhi to Udaipur in Rajasthan. Um, Udaipur is like the city of lakes. It's very beautiful, it's very traditional. You know, a lot of the women there still wear traditional saris and Indian wear. It's really cool, um, beautiful place. It's a, a huge tour, tourist destination within India and within Asia as a whole. Like a lot of people go there as, uh, as tourists. So it's really beautiful. And, um, but whenever we were in Delhi and they were like, where are you traveling to next? And we'd say Udapur, they were like, where? We're like, Udapur? They are like, where? We're like, Udapur. They were like, oh, Udapur. And we were like, that, that's what we said the whole time. It was so funny. I don't know. So maybe I'm butchering it. I don't know. So it took us almost 48 hours to finally get there. I was not jet lagged. 
at that time in my life, I somehow was like immune to jet lag. I was really good at sleeping on planes. I still am, although jet lag does affect me a little bit more now. As I get older, man, even just getting to like mid-20s, hangovers affect you more, travel affects you more. Like, enjoy your teens and early 20s, my friends, because it will hit you, okay? You don't lose weight as easily. You gain it quicker. Like, it's crazy how much just getting to your middle 20s affects you. Um, so at that time, like, I just slept on the flights and got to India and Emily was super jet lagged. I was not at all. So I was like ready to hit up India. I was like, oh my God, I'm here. This has been my lifelong dream to go to India. It's real. Like, let's go out. Let's hit the town. Let's do things. And she was like super jet lagged and wanted to sleep all day. So that sucked. We had separate rooms. So I literally just like sat in my room because, uh, you know, I'm blind, 19 and have a cane. Like I couldn't just get up and explore by myself. I had to rely on her, which sucked. That's like one of the most frustrating things about being blind. And so I had to rely on her and she was sleeping all day. So I would like get hungry and need food and she'd be sleeping down the hall and I don't know, it, was, it sucked. But we were at a really nice hotel. Not like, you know, quite North American standards, but like quite nice compared to what I was going to end up staying in for most of the time. Um, but we did, like, she got over her jet lag and we ended up getting to kind of explore for the next three days and prepare for when the kids would get there. Now, shortly after I arrived, our on-the-ground Indian staff, you know, that we would meet up with to prepare for the trip, shared with me that one of my fans, um, like, one girl who was a big fan of mine, was in the hospital from a previous Indian trip with this company. Um, her trip had already gone home but she had to stay because she had typhoid fever, which is really bad. And even though she had had all the like shots and stuff, she still got it. Um, and I was like, they were like, would you mind visiting her in hospital? It would like really brighten her spirits. Um, she's not allowed to fly home to Canada for like a few more days. And when she gets to Canada, she'll have to go straight to hospital to continue treatment. Like it was really bad. And so I was like, yeah, of course, I'd love to go visit her and make her feel better. So I went to the hospital, I visited her. She was super sweet, it was really nice. That was that. For the rest of those four days, we kind of like explored the neighborhood and like got prepared for the youth and Vanessa to fly in. I was just enjoying myself. I was loving all the food, like it was so yummy. I was having a lot of fun and living my best Indian life. But I should also mention that the entire flight we were on, I can't remember what airline, but it was an Indian airline. I don't know if any of you will know the airline, but like all the seats and the carpeting is red, like a ruby red, and all the food was Indian and all the staff were Indian. And um, they would do this weird thing that I've never seen as a frequent flyer on any other flights. They would walk down the aisles like periodically through each aisle with like Lysol cans and just hold them in the air with masks on and like spray down the aisle. It was so funny. We were like, what are they doing? Emily, who I was traveling with, was sick the whole flight. So she was drinking like Neocitrin, which is a cold medicine. She was sick the whole time. So it's morning. Vanessa and the 25 to 30 youth are all arriving. We go to the airport, we pick them up. And the reason they have us was because they wanted people on the ground that were gonna be like adjusted to the time zone and like adjusted to the environment so that when poor Vanessa has just done this whole travel on her own with 30 kids, you know, she could have a break and we could take care of the kids who were all gonna be jet lagged and whatnot. So that's why. So they get in and we end up, you know, all loading onto a bus with all of our backpacks, hiking backpacks, and starting the like two and a half hour journey to a more rural part of Rajasthan where we were all gonna be staying because this was like a service trip. Um, it was like volunteerism, but very little tourism, very much more volunteerism. So, we drove out to a very rural community where we were gonna be building a school. And um, we were staying at this, you know, it was like this one hotel that was in the area that was not at all to the standards of what we were staying at in Udaipur or what anybody in North America would be used to staying in. Um, but it was fine, like, I'm, I'm a girl who likes to rough it, you know? Like, I love my makeup and my glam, but I'm also like, get down and dirty. I grew up camping. I grew up a camp counselor in Canada. Like I love, like I've been on like 
six day canoe trips with nothing but two pairs of clothes. Like I am used to that stuff, you know? So it didn't bother me. That's a whole other story also I should tell you guys one day. That was a trip. It didn't bother me roughing it like this. I had been in Kenya for a month where it was much more rough. Like we were staying in tents. Like at least this was like a hotel with real beds. But we bring the kids, we get there. That night, I read them the book, Everybody Poops. And by I read, I mean, I brought it out and had them each read line by line or page by page around in a circle because, you know, when you are from North America and you go to places like India or Kenya, you're eating different foods, you're on different medications, you're in different environments, um, there's different bacteria, so poop problems can happen. For example, I was super constipated for the whole like first five days in Kenya and I had to get help for that. And so, you know, I wanted, you know, Poop is something that for some reason people are really uncomfortable about. I never have been. It's like a fact of life, you know? It's normal, it's human. We all do it. As much as men like to pretend women don't, we do. And so that was kind of like one of the fun things I wanted to do to start off. Like be like, hey guys, you might have poop problems. Like come to us, we're here to help you. Don't be ashamed, don't be embarrassed, it's cool. We can all talk about this. So we did that. And that evening, probably around like 6 p.m., Keep in mind, this is August, it's monsoon season in India, very humid. I was like freezing. I'm like layering up whatever I had, like a windbreaker, sweater, scarf. I'm really cold. And I was like, is anybody else really cold? And everybody was like, no. I was like, God, I'm like yawning, I'm really freezing. I thought maybe jet lag is like finally hitting me four days in. And so I was like, I'm gonna hit to, head to bed early if that's okay. And so this hotel was like all flagstones, like big rocks with like kind of like trails of dirt between them. So it was like very uneven, which for a blind person isn't the easiest. And there was tons of stairs up and down, so many stairs. And we as the counselors were at like the furthest from like the base part of the, uh, of the hotel where we'd be like eating and spending most of our time. So I had like a long distance to get to, but you know, after a few days I had like learned it, but at first I would have other people like helped me get to the room. I was sharing a room with Emily and Vanessa. So there was three single beds in this room. This hotel had zero like hot water. So all of our showers, which we could take like every three days to conserve water, uh, every four days maybe, were all cold water showers. Very humid, damp rooms. So like literally like the bedding was wet. And like, it's not like a hotel where they change the sheets a lot. like. The sheets you get are the sheets you get for the month. So they were like the bed, the mattress, the sheets, the comforter, the pillow, everything was very damp. So that's just an idea of where like the vibe of what the room I would be staying in for the next three weeks was gonna be like for me. I like go up to bed and I go to sleep and I wake up the next morning in severe pain in my throat, like really bad pain. And I was like, oh God, I'm sick. And so for the first day, I like push through, I have a sore throat. I'm like, it's okay, it's cool. I'm gonna get through this. By the next day, I like couldn't even swallow. Like every time I would go to swallow, I would physically brace myself. So I would put one hand on my chest and one around my throat and I would like hold myself while I would try to swallow because it was so bad. And by day three, I had a high fever. I if you visit, like, if you just like shot a flashlight in my throat, you could see it was like, okay, this is where it's gonna start to get real gross from here on out. The rest of this video, guys, is going to be gross. So if you're not into medically things, tune out. Um, my, you could see like pus in my throat and I had no voice. I'm talking zero voice. I couldn't even whisper. Like no sound would come out. And as a professional speaker who full-time my career was public speaking at this time, that was terrifying for me. I had had sickness in my throat in the past, I had never, ever lost my voice to the point of not even being able to whisper. And at this point I was really struggling like with this idea of like, if I was in Canada, like I really, I checked my privilege growing up in a country with free healthcare. You know, some argue it's free, which is why I do that a lot when I say it. You know, to me growing up, it's free healthcare. Like I'm just, as a, like my family, I was used to like knowing that we just pay taxes for that. And even when I became an adult and paid my own taxes in Canada, like that was worth it to me to have options to like go to the walk-in clinic when I needed to and get medication. So for me, like 
for these three days of sickness, I was battling with this idea that if I was in Canada, I would have just had my mom drive me around the block to a, a walk-in clinic, been seen and gotten medication and gotten help. But in India, I'm like, it's two and a half hours away to the nearest like Western hospital. What do I do? And so finally it was like a Sunday and our kind of lead on the ground who who lived full time in India, she, she was from North America, but she lived full time in India running these trips year round. Um, she came up to check on our group and she was like, she saw me and she was like, you need to go to the hospital. I got in a car and drove two and a half hours to an emergency room. And she was with me because she had to go back to Udapur, which is where her base was. And so we drove together for two and a half hours and she brings me to the emergency room. We get in there. It's really interesting. Like it's just, you know, there's like differences. Like we had to take our shoes off before we could enter the emergency room. And when we got in there as the only like foreigner traveler Caucasian walking in there, they immediately got me a bed. And this is a very small emergency room. And like the room where the bed was, was just like within the waiting room. It was just a bed with a curtain around it. So they bring me in there immediately. They start like feeling my glands were so swollen. I had severe pain, like I said, like no other pain I'd ever felt in my throat. And I, like I said, when they looked in my throat, they could see like pus and infection. And so they immediately were like, you know, we don't know if it's strep throat, but it, you have like a very severe infection of some sort. And they immediately put me on painkillers anti-inflammatories, antibiotics, and probiotics, which I think is super cool. I take probiotics every day anyways, but I think it's really cool that when they prescribe things for you in India, they actually, and this happened throughout my whole stay, so they prescribe probiotics. I think that's really important because it's good for your gut health. Like antibiotics kill a lot, of, they kill the bad, but they also kill the good. So to put the probiotics, the good stuff back in while you're doing that is really important. So we went, we filled all my prescriptions. And at this time I had been unable to eat because my throat was so swollen and so sore. Like I said, I had to brace myself every time I swallowed. Like I was taking long gaps in between swallowing because I was in so much pain. So I couldn't eat because all the food was spicy. And because we were in a rural part of India, they couldn't get dairy to us. So like I couldn't get yogurt, ice cream, like any cold dairy products that I would usually eat. I remember just being like, oh my God, if I was in Canada right now, I would have my yogurt, my ice cream, my popsicles, like all of those things you typically would eat when you have a really severe sore throat. And I couldn't have any of them. But in Udaipur, I could. So she took me to get um, like a cold ice cream and it was, oh my God, I just guzzled that thing. It was like a milkshake, a cold ice cream milkshake. I guzzled it. I got popsicles like I stocked up and had so much food because I hadn't really eaten for three days and um, took my medic my first round of medications and drove the two and a half hours on my own this time again as a blind young girl two and a half hours in the back of a car with somebody who didn't speak English um, back to my base camp and I get there I go to sleep the next day I wake up and I had a banana it was all I could have and um, I took my medications. And at that point, even though I was still so sick, they were like, you can take the day off. And I was like, no, I'm working. Like, I'm here to work. I have medication now. It's fine. Like, I'm just trying to prove myself. You know, I'm young, I'm 19, I'm in this workplace. Like, I wanna show this company that like, I deserve this job and I can get through it. And I'm a tough ass, you know, like I can do it. And so we immediately, that morning was gonna be our first morning going to, work or the first first morning at least that I was going to be going so I get in a car with Vanessa and the rest go in other cars and um we get to the workplace and oh my god I was like a zombie I just kind of like sat on this wall while everybody else was working just like sitting there like zoned out spaced out for like hours like just we are done to go back to lunch um it's like midday now we had spent probably three to four hours there working and I get in the car with Vanessa again, like nobody else with us. And I like lean back and I close my eyes and she's like, are you okay? And I was like, I feel not good. Like I feel really sick. And before I knew it, I was projectile vomiting. These streets are like these narrow, like whirly curly streets, like bumps and stuff. I 
projectile vomited just water and banana. That was it. That was all that was in my system. Water, banana, and medication all over myself, all over my shirt, all over my new shirt, my new sweatpants, all over the car, all over the back seat, like everywhere. They were trying to get me bags and they were trying to pull over and the bags had holes in them and oh my God, it was so disgusting. And I didn't want the kids to see me when I ca our car arrived. Our car arrived a little bit late because obviously they had pulled over at a certain point for me to keep vomiting. And we get back to camp and some of the kids were like waiting for me because they're like, where's Molly? You know, they're excited. And um, <clears throat> I we, we had Emily tell them, you know, they all had to go to their rooms or like go to lunch. And I get out and I'm just, drenched and I had to walk so far from like where we get off to like the other end like I said of the resort where my room is just drenched the clothes are sticking to me it was disgusting and I said to them like is there some is there somewhere that they can wash the clothes like is there like a laundry room or something and they were like oh yeah but just put them in a bag and we'll have them sent to dry cleaning and the poor guys they had to get they had to take this blanket out of the back of their car that was covering their seat. Like, it was so bad. I put it in a bag for them. Long story short, they never ended up taking it. I threw those clothes out because I kept thinking they were going to take it. it. It sat in a bag for five days before I realized they weren't going to take it. And I kept asking every day, are they going to take it? And finally, they were like, no, they don't want to touch the vomit. And I was like, that's fair. So I, like, threw out these brand new sweatpants and Roots t-shirt that I loved. It was very sad. Um, cause it had been soaking in vomit for five days at that point. Like I was like, okay, that's fair. I don't want to touch it either. And I like got in this cold shower and I showered off and they were like, you can take the afternoon off Molly. <laughs> so I laid in this damp, moist bed all afternoon alone. And thus would begin a long month. Um, over the next few days, I was noticing that the feeling I was feeling was going away, like that pus where I felt like I couldn't swallow. Like, cause when I was trying to swallow, I felt like I was choking cause everything was so swollen and pus filled. Like I felt like I was choking and that feeling was starting to go away and that sharp dagger pain was starting to go away, but a new pain was emerging. I was starting to feel like my throat was filled with paper cuts. Like I started to tell anybody like, cause I could start to eat a little bit more, but then anything I would eat would feel like acid being poured on a paper cut. Like it was like such a sharp, it was like an, un, it was such a different pain that I had never felt in my life. And so it had been a couple days out of this and they were like, you need to go to the hospital again. So this time I get in the car on my own by myself. And by the way, I spent every single day, all day in a bed by myself, all alone, blind, rural India, 19, in a damp, moist bed with cold showers, sick and alone. I listened to uh, Sticks and Stones by Emily Babylon, Basilon. Um, I listened to Demi Lovato. Yeah, it was, it was a long, long days, very long days and very lonely, very isolating and really depressing, just being so sick and just, yeah, it was a really big growing experience for me. I had never had that before. Taking care of myself. And when you're sick, like all you want is somebody to help take care of you. And it was just me. And I'm hardly eating, just laying in this bed all day. And so finally they're like, you need to go to the hospital again. So on my own, I get in this car again with a stranger, spend two and a half hours going out and this time to an ears, nose and throat specialist or an ENT. And I go to this examination and literally exactly what they thought, what I thought was happening, like what I felt was exactly what was happening. He was like, your throat is like corroded. Like your tonsils have little cuts all over them and all down your throat has like cuts, like open sores, like these wounds. I was in so much pain and he was like, all I can guess is that because you vomited mostly what would have been stomach acid on an infected throat is it just corroded like the throat and so he was like you can't really eat anything but yogurt or an ice cream and I was like I can't have access to those things so it was like so frustrating so again he put me on a whole new round of anti-inflammatories painkillers and um, antibiotics and probiotics so I got all new medications finished that first round started my second round and 
in a few days, I started to get better. And all I could have when I'm freezing cold, freezing cold, I'm telling you, the whole trip in India, I wore knee-high socks, pants, sweaters, scarves, jackets, hoods up. Like, I was freezing this whole month in, in August in India. And all I had was cold showers and damp beds. The rooms started to grow mold, so we had this whole issue where all the kids' stuff started getting moldy, all of their bags. So you can imagine, like, breathing in all this mold, like, I just couldn't get better. So I started using one of the girls' work phones to call my office and beg them every day to send me home. I was crying on the phone, begging them, like, please, just send me home. Like, I'm not working. You know, these kids aren't hanging out with me anyways. I'm just laying in bed alone all day. And I can't get better. Like, my immune system at this point is so shot. I'm surrounded by bacteria my body isn't used to when my immune system is so down. I'm surrounded by mold, cold showers. I'm alone in bed every day all day. These girls are coming in at night, turning on the lights, discussing the day. And I was in the middle bed, so they're, like, discussing it over me. I was like, I can't. I can't get better here. Like, I need to be home with my family and with my health care and with things that are going to be you know, good for me. And they were like, what do you, what do you need? Like, what would make you feel better? We don't want you to go home and then get better and regret leaving. And I was like, trust me, I'm not going to get better here. And then when the second infection started to get better, a new infection came. And this one was the most severe lady infection I've ever had in my life. I got a yeast infection, which yeast infections are, you know, you get often when all the bacteria in your body has been killed. I had to go to two and a half hours to a gynecologist, again, on my own. The the woman who worked like on the ground in Udapur would meet me at the hospitals, but like I would do all the travel on my own. So I get there, she takes me to the gynecologist, they do like a typical gyno surge, and, and she said to me, she's like, look, you're really sick, like you've been on a lot of antibiotics, like all the bacteria is killed and you have a very severe yeast infection, but I don't want to give you oral antibiotics because your stomach is like messed up now your system is messed up now I, so she gave me suppositories they were gel tablets that I had to insert every day I had never done anything like that before so just that I was like freaked out by because I was like what this is so weird like I've never done that this yeast infection you guys I was on fire I would literally soak face cloths in cold water and lay with them between my legs and just like curl in a ball and rock back and forth it was like nothing I've ever experienced. I was just like, oh my God, it was ungodly. Like it was nasty. And it was again, TMI, but like women's health, you know, it's the reality. When I put the suppositories in, you know, usually you would wear like a pad, um, but I didn't have any pads. So I would just wear underwear, but like the medication would leak, seep out and like, get everywhere and like oh my god it was so awful it was really awful so I would like literally just sleep with cold face cloths between my legs I could hardly walk I was so uncomfortable but I was trying to like put on a good face for the kids and like do my job and be in a good mood and shortly after this infection started to clear up I got five days of diarrhea five days of what they call deli belly you know the typical and again, I think it was more so, like, I was hardly eating, so I don't think it was the food, because I was just drinking, like, coconut water and bananas, whatever I could get my hands on out in the rural area, and any snacks that I had brought, which was, like, fruit strips, goldfish crackers. To this day, goldfish crackers are, like, a huge comfort food of mine, because they, like, got me through. Um, but when I had throat infections, I couldn't eat it because the fruit had too much fruit acid, and it would burn the cuts, and the goldfish had too much um, salt, and it would burn the cuts. So I could finally start to eat that now that I had just the lady infection. Then I started getting diarrhea for five days. Um, like I had to be near a toilet at all times. I couldn't leave my room. I had to be by a toilet because even though I wasn't eating, stuff found its way out. Um, and by then, the kids were going home. That was the three weeks. That was the three weeks that the kids were with me. I was finally like the last day, like really starting to get better. And um, we brought all the kids back to Udapur to go to the airport. Emily and I stayed a final three days to like wrap up things 
there. We stayed in the same hotel as we did at the beginning. Finally, I was able to start getting in contact with my mom, but I didn't want to freak her out, so I didn't really tell like my mom or my boyfriend the full extent of what had happened. I was finally able to start like eating foods again, and I had more access to things like ice cream, so I was eating like this incredible mango ice cream. And, um, and then I flew home, and I was 85 pounds when I went, and I was probably 75, 78 pounds when I got home. I'm four foot ten and a half, so it's not as dramatic as it sounds, but that's still a lot of weight for somebody to lose in a month. And I was still, like, my stomach was still super messed up. Um, I went to the doctor when I got home, and they were like, yeah, I mean, we can't tell you what you had. Like, I think you probably just had a lot of things, a lot of infections we probably don't even have here. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really humbling. I really understood at this point how lucky I was to have access to free medical care but just to be to have access to like close medical care um I really understood that and I really understood like how lucky I was to have a family who would support me when I was sick and who would be there for me how lucky I was to have a safe warm comfortable bed to have access to hot water like I think if I was healthy I wouldn't have fully understood you know healthy during that month I wouldn't have fully understood how lucky I was to have those things. But being sick and not having those things gave me a whole new perspective. And so as like, much as I wish I could have gone home and gotten better quicker and sooner, um, but I grew a lot. I grew a lot with my independence, you know, just knowing that like I had to rely on myself and nobody else to get through this. I, I grew a lot as a person. So as awful as that month was and as much as I wish like the people that were there would have helped me more and that like the company would have sent me home and whatnot. Like I'm also, I know that it really, and my mom always says this, like that month changed you. It did, it changed me. And, um, oh, the ride home was a whole other story. On that journey home, I had spent all my money on medical care. Like all my, all the cash I had went to paying all my, for all my medications and doctor's visits. So I had no more money left. And we would have like 10 hour layovers. So the girl I was with, Emily, would be like buying food for herself and not for me. Um, yeah, it was really tough. It was really tough. So that was, that was the month in India where I thought I was gonna die. And I was really scared at times, but at the end of the day, like when I hit that ground, I was so happy to be able to go to my nutritionist, my naturopath, my doctor, to be able to eat again and have, you know, a clean, warm bath and a comfortable, cozy bed. And yeah, I it really checked my privilege, um, both as, you know, a North American white girl and also, you know, as, as somebody who has a loving, supportive family who's there for me and helps me when I need it. Check out my book, It's Not What It Looks Like, to hear more tidbits from my life. And thumbs us up if you want me to write a suit. A super book? A future book. Shout out to my Indian fans, or my Indian friends, supporters, I don't know, my bees, whatever you want to be called. I love you guys. I love all of you. Okay. Ugh, I'm going to start crazy because I'm getting so hot. All right. Bye.